Good evening, everybody. I am Anushka, and I feel immense pleasure in welcoming you all to this thought-provoking event session: reimagining, reskilling, and preparing our youth for the post-pandemic world. So, Jeev Shakta, in conversation with Akanksha Tyagi, I would like to take this moment to describe and welcome our guest for the day, Sir Jeev Shakta. Mr. Shakta is a thought leader who traverses. many worlds he earned the title of nepal's ceo chief eternal optimist for the optimism projected by him in his book unleashing nepal he writes and speaks extensively on business development economy and leadership and writes a regular column for the kathmandu post his book unleashing the vajra nepal's journey between india and china was launched in january 2020 I now introduce Akanksha Tyagi. Ms. Tyagi is the founder of Social Friendly and an artist by passion. She interprets the convergence of human interventions across business, art, and lifestyle. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks a lot, Anushka. Welcome, Suji. It's really great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Akanksha, yeah, I am also looking forward to the conversation. Yes, and uh, as you know, today's topic is uh, reimagining the future, reskilling, and preparing our youth for the post-pandemic world, and of course, taking inspiration uh, from your journey, from your experiences that we discuss in this uh, dialogue that we have today. And I am very, very sure that the students who have joined us today. uh will take back a lot with them uh, i i want to let you know that other than ims college we have uh, students with us from st stephens from ipem um from ifa and uh, satyavati college from du and kite college so we have a uh, quite a good uh, lot with us who are really looking forward so we should begin sure sure great great so um sujeev i'm going to start with uh, a very obvious question that you know people have been asking for the past one year but albeit it is an essential a very important question um as we all know when the pandemic struck last year we were all taken by surprise and uh, we were in a way sort of trying to answer questions that frankly we did not have answers to and um, interestingly dialogues and comments such as this started coming up that we need to write off this year and 2020 year is a total waste 2020 cannot be counted at all you know we should not consider it a year in our lives and and things like that but i for one personally i know it very well that you absolutely refused to adhere to any such comment um if not more so your productivity in terms of everything that you were doing was um i i believe it was matching up to what it was before pandemic so i want you to tell our students here that how did you achieve that what was your process and especially what you learned and unlearned in the process uh while achieving that no thanks uh, kanksha i think um, you know uh, when when the pandemic uh, the first case from guam came to nepal it was already january and but we never took it seriously i was in my travels i was in um, you know i was in the us then i was in uh, east asia and then i took the actually the last flight from bangkok to kathmandu and then as this was going on it did give me a lot of opportunity to process my thinking in terms of uh, you know sort of what is what does all this mean and i think it's all about looking reflecting on what works better uh you know sort of what what, what is a better thing to uh, look at um so in terms of um, uh, you you need to see what are some of the what i did was to reflect upon what are some of the areas in which you had 
a lot of challenges and how did you overcome? So you you learn from your past and you say that, okay, uh, we for Nepal, we went through 10 years of uh, insurgency. Uh, there was a big earthquake in 2015. And you also look at these disruptions that take place and you say that, how do you how do you manage this disruption and what does this mean? And it's also to look forward in terms of, um, you know, with the mindset that uh, the dark clouds only always don't remain. There is always, you know, sort of the clouds are going to go away. It's not going to stay away. You'll see a clear sky one day. So it's all about preparing. How are you going to go through these dark times? And uh, and initially we were not at all, you know, sort of prepared for a very long uh, shutdown and disruption. But then over a period of time, you adapt. So adaptability becomes very important. Yeah, so that's how I would reflect on. And I think as we go into this conversation, more than, you know, sort of happy to, uh, you know, deep dive into it. Yeah. Absolutely agree, agreed. I absolutely agree with everything that you're saying. In fact, you know, all the conversations that we have had over the years have been very reflective in nature. And uh, for me also personally, you know, everything that we spoke about and learned uh, all those years, uh, I took it uh, very close to me and I keep it very close to me and, and it helps a lot during times like this. So, I mean, that takes me to my next question that I want to ask you is that, I'm, I mean, we all know that uh, the world around us is, is experiencing a paradigm shift. Uh, whether we talk about geopolitics, whether we talk about business, economy, all industries everywhere. In fact, to put it in a way that even us humans, uh, we are going through a major change. For example, we are having to inculcate habits uh, that, that we did not care of okay, or care about before. So how do you think this new world new world new world that everyone keeps talking about day in and day out how do you think this new world is shaping up and a that is what i want to understand and b what are some basic um habits that us as humans uh, all of us students working professionals anyone we need to inculcate in our lives early right now so that any situation unprecedented that happens uh, ever, uh, God forbid, in the future, we are prepared for it. I think uh, it's it's the way I look at it. It, it is about the mindset. It is about uh, how do you think? Uh, what is your mindset? Uh, whether you look at an issue as a problem or do you look at it as an opportunity? And I think for, you know, so like um, with my the consulting firm Bead, we saw, okay, Nepal is going to be a challenge. So I didn't spend more time in Rwanda in the past four or five months because we saw more opportunities there. So it's all about, you know, we we said, okay, there's going to be a lot of work in the digital space, uh, digital finance space, uh, you know, sort of access to finance space. And we started actively pursuing that. And then we started now we've got our work happening in Cambodia and Laos, though managing it uh, distantly. So, so it's all about looking at opportunity. So, so when you are at home, one is to say that, oh God, I'm homebound. The other is to really look at it positively to say that, when was the last I spent so much of time with my family? When was the last I could just, you know, sort of watch a uh, series or movies together? When was the last we, in, you know, enjoyed cooking and eating together. And it's all about looking around. We could see the mountains. We could see the blue skies. We could hear the birds chirp. So it's all about, again, um, getting satisfied with little things in life and and which is related to my sort of, you know, sort of thoughts and the practice around gratitude is to be thinking about how can we be thankful for whatever is around us? How can we be happy with uh, what is around us and little things the fact that you wake up in the morning alive itself becomes a very important thing which you know these little awareness becomes so important is to really look inside and say that you know what, what is it uh, that drives me and how can i you know sort of take advantage of the situation around me 
rather than most many people look at it from a very negative perspective and so i'm homebound that if, you know all oh, there's a problem 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 but then you can say that okay what is it i can do how can i look at opportunity if you have time then how can you do things to reskill yourself uh, how can you engage in reading in in watching interesting videos uh, in in maybe writing so 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 you can engage in a multiple fold uh, of activities that would keep you positive that would keep you going and also continuously reflecting upon uh, the gratitude part of it to say that i am more fortunate than many people our family is more fortunate than, than many people our country is more fortunate than many people so it's all about uh, looking back and and you know sort of uh, being thankful uh, to what is ha having uh, you know happening around you interesting interesting agreed agreed 100% agreed and this reminds me as i said again uh, to a lot of discussions that we had earlier a uh, few years back when i was also starting out i reached out to you to help me guide me and um, i don't know if you remember or not sujeev at that time uh, during one of our conversations you pointed out the three basic skills that every human being should have i have i have held that conversation so close to me i believe it to be a mantra in life and that has in fact proved to be so true i will leave it up to you to explain those three essential skills to the students here and then sort of uh, bringing on to the conversation that we have here that is reskilling that uh, after we talk about those three basic skills i want you to throw some light on how does the reskilling uh, uh the space of reskilling the entire ideology of reskilling look now especially for students uh i think uh, the way um i see it is that you know the, the the three skills i think we talk a lot about it and i remember just talking to a a graduating class here i think more of uh, people who are getting out of high school and i and these these three skills i talk about is that you must know how to cook and i think during this pandemic if you didn't know how to cook you're in serious trouble you know uh, and i can tell you some stories around that i was uh, working with some uh, folks in thailand on this uh, the second is that uh, you must be able to drive or you must be an explorer so if people who could explore uh, you could virtually explore you could you know physically explore walk do different things that brought you to uh, tremendous joy and i think third is to say storyteller and if you see during the pandemic people who have survived as storytellers they had stories about everything you know they could tell stories about everything and i think that's so important and especially when we come to basic skills i think this pandemic also exposed to to us to say that what are the basic skills you require like you are stuck at home in a lockdown and there's a leakage in your pipe and you don't know how to fix it you are in trouble so you must really learn how to do some basic plumbing skills so uh, basic electrical skills so you know i mean it just gets back to the basic of living and i and it was very interesting i was doing a session uh, with, uh an international group of uh, young professionals and there was this group in in uh, in bangkok uh you know sort of works for one of these large consulting companies uh, they used to literally spend their time in uh, you know they used to work out in the gym at the four seasons they used to go have breakfast there they they spend most of their time eating out uh, their apartment which is a very fancy apartment in one of the best addresses in bangkok uh they they had a pantry but with just a microwave just had an induction you know sort of a heater and a microwave and when the pandemic hit i mean they got stuck i mean they didn't know what to do you know where to get their food i mean they just to get pizza delivered they had to spend a lot of effort so it comes back to you know sort of what is it that the basic skills that you require and if you look at people in the villages for them this pandemic didn't really matter much if you're growing your potatoes you're growing your rice you're growing your vegetables they were growing food they were eating they were having a good time and so so it also reflects on what are some of the skills and if you look at uh, a lot of people took into gardening a lot of people got into doing kitchen garden doing little things that would give them food give them you know sort of the basic you know basic sewing you know you, you couldn't go to the tailor you had to you know i mean we all learned I, mean, I i did a lot of you know i got back to doing my you know chopping my own hair with a machine which 
I have not done from my school, uh, college days in the US. You know, so, so you get back to some basic skills. And I think the more you reflect on those skills, then you figure out if you're in a corporation, if you're in a not-for-profit, if you're in academia, if you're in any other field, what is the basic skills that is required? You know, so we keep on talking about big things, but we don't really get into the basic. And so I think this uh, pandemic also helped us uh, to look at these basic skills. And when we talk about the new world order, uh, what is emerging, I think people with some of these basic right in any field would take them, uh, you know, sort of places and would be the ones who would, you know, sort of lead the pack and you know leave the others behind for those who cannot cope with it. Yeah. Well. Amazing. Amazing. Agreed. You know, uh, you were talking about cutting our you would be surprised that even I am giving myself haircuts. Uh, it's been almost a year and now that people have started going back to salon, I just don't feel like putting my money into that anymore because I've been getting such good responses. Honestly, I'm very happy giving myself haircuts. So, yes, I definitely agree to that. And I'm sure the students here are also uh, uh, agreeing uh, and nodding their heads vigorously to uh, to the tips and skills that you're talking about. Um, now, I see, Sujeev, I want to take this conversation to a different route now. I want to be talking about future, future. Let me take it a bit uh, to the past. And uh, before I do that, I want to read two lines from uh, one of my favorite pieces of yours, from Himalayan Ark. Uh, you'd written a chapter in Himalayan Ark. It's called the Himalayan citizen. I will read only two lines here. Uh, so there, here it goes. You write, for us, the mountains were precious. Only those which had snow on the peaks were mountains. The rest were hills. They were to be revered. They did not have finite shapes. They were symbols of the infinite. They showed us our insignificance in the larger scheme of things. Wow. <laughs> First of all, uh, many, many congratulations on, on this, on uh, unleashing the Vajra, on Arthata Satantra, and then the one that came after that, on so many wonderful uh, books that you've written, such wonderful work that you do. So now uh, coming back to the question, I want, uh, I want to know that what inspired you to become an author, especially at such a earlier time in your career, because usually if you notice, uh, what people do is that they, when, when they're at the finish line, you know, when they're trying to wind off their career, then they sit back and say, okay, now I can write a memoir. I can sit down and jot down my ideologies, what I learned and what I didn't. But you started off so early. So what made you do that? You know, what struck you uh, that you thought that you should be an author uh, while you were at the peak of your career? You still are. And tell us something about your journey from unleashing Nepal to unleashing the Vajra. Um, I think I got into, you know, writing was something very uh, special to me as I grew up. I did a lot of um, non-fiction, uh, uh, fiction work, short stories, and then I used to write in Nepali, I used to write in English. Uh, I think for me, writing forces you to read. It's a vicious circle. Uh, you read, uh, and because you read, you get you want to write, and because you write, you have to read. And so I think I write also to force myself to read. Like, I mean, you know, this weekend I'll be writing, say, my, you know, the column I've been running with now, the leading paper here, the Kathmandu Post. I've been writing columns now for, what, 25 years. And then uh, when I look at it, why, you know, sort of every time I want to write something, I, I am forced to read. And I think that that pushes you to read. And uh, so that's important because reading is not something that comes to you very, very uh, uh very easily uh the the second is that i would say is that as i was telling in the three skills you one of the skills is to be a storyteller and i also realized that 
everybody doesn't want to be a storyteller and everybody doesn't want to take their stories public. You may have views, you may have opinions, but you do not want to take it public. Uh, so, but yeah, so I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed telling stories. It's about be it the Himalayas or be it about Nepal, be it about the stupa in Borobudur or be about the lanes in Boston. You know, I enjoyed uh, telling the stories. And I think, uh, so it becomes like an addiction. And if you don't write, you feel there's something missing. And also the joy of writing is that when people write back to you, so you write your columns, people call you up and say, oh, you know, we read it. It was so interesting. It was so insightful. Uh, people, you know, sort of uh, cite your work. Uh, they talk about it. And so you feel there is also a moral obligation. Like uh, from Unleashing Nepal, when I wrote, I wrote about a history of Nepal that began uh, from Prithvi Narayan Shah, the Shah dynasty in 1776. But then I was writing, people are saying, you should write about history before that. Now, Unleashing Nepal, Unleashing the Vajra, I've started my book around, you know, sort of the 8th century. You know, looking at there was Nepal also at that point of time on what happened, uh, you know, sort of the relationship with then India, then China, Tibet, the Himalayas. So, so you also feel that you have an obligation to tell stories. So I think you, you start becoming a writer. Uh, first as a hobby, but over a period of time, then also I think you it becomes like your moral responsibility uh, to 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 do that. And I think you know every time some event like you know like when uh, Bi President Biden uh, won the elections, of course I didn't write something, but then after the inauguration, I got so many requests to say, "What does this mean to Nepal?" You know, please can you tell us? And I said, "Okay, let me write a piece on it." You know. Uh, what does a new president in the United States means for Nepal? Uh, so, so that's 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 how it is. Like when when the foreign secretary from India visited uh, Nepal, people said, you know, in India, people would like to know what people from Nepal feel about it. And I wrote a piece uh, for the Hindu and said, you know, uh, perhaps there's a new beginning here. I think we can restart. You know, we can rekindle the relations. So, so it it becomes a varied you know set of reasons that forces you to write. And then it's like, as Malcolm Gladwell says, the more you do it, the better you become at. And the more open you are with the feedback, uh, the better your writing becomes. But one thing I definitely, for anybody who is aspiring to be a writer and take writing forward, one thing I definitely you know, believe in is that you need a very good editor. And so my writings have been great, not because of my own writing, but of great editors I've had. Uh, from my Unleashing Nepal to Unleashing the Vajra, I had Ranjana Sengupta, one of the stolid editors of Penguin India, who you know sort of did some great work for uh, for my papers that I write. I get some great uh, editors in the respective organizations. So it's also important, you know, to it's like a teamwork. You are only there uh, to instigate some of those things, but there are many other people who make it happen. Sorry, it's a very passionate thing. So I went on and on, but yeah. But I no, think no, no, you know, we there are multiple want to go on and on because uh, this uh, entire conversation is intended to be like that, so that we can, you know, hear you, hear your journey, and take inspiration from that. And uh, yes, that was very, very interesting. And uh, now we are towards the end of this segment. Uh, so, I mean, the students uh, who are watching this, I'm sure you all, you all feel very inspired right now. I've been getting so many questions regarding uh, what you do as an author and stuff like that. We'll come to that later. Uh, but I want to tell all the students here who are watching this that uh, recently a case study was made uh, on the life and journey and career of uh, Sujeev Shakya. So and and I want Sujeev to tell us a bit about it, and and is it accessible? And and I want to uh, let you all know that the case study was done by Babson College in US. Yeah, I think um, yeah. So um, because as a as a person who does coaching, as a person who believes in reflective leadership, uh, because leadership journey is all about continuous reflection, and how do you reflect? How do you get feedback? Uh, so I've been very fortunate to have the Columbia, you know, coaching 
uh, alumni group that uh, I attend uh, sessions and there are stuff I read that gives me tremendous inspiration. I have people to go to. But then I had this uh, professor friend of mine and he said that, you know, he proposed this idea that why don't you do, you know, be open to do a case study, which means that you your life will be opened up in front of students and you'll be dissected and they'll ask questions. And then that becomes a continuous journey. So this began a year ago in Babson College at the Entrepreneur Leadership Program, which is the number one program in US for past 16 years. It's a very prestigious program. So, so then in this session, they begin with uh, talking about the six types of leadership, Daniel Goldman, Goldman leadership, you know, uh, types of leadership. And then it goes on to, you know, my life of uh, what we call is a multi-potentialite. You know, should a leader do one thing or do multiple things? And, and that's a very interesting discussions that go in. I was physically present in the class last year, and then I did one in virtually in October. And now, interestingly, what happened was that my professor friend has been tracking me. And then this was case A that was, you know, and the crux of the case was that, uh, you know, there are so many options in front of Sujeev Shakya. So what does he do? Where should he focus? And this was happening. And that, and I was, the case B was about to begin and the COVID struck. Now the case B is, which is going to be, um, you know, sort of discussed in another two weeks, uh, is about what did he do then during the COVID-19? And uh, was it the right thing he did? Uh, should he have done something different? And where is his journey going from here? So it's a very interesting way in which uh, you can get to reflective leadership, where you can open yourself to be questioned by young minds, and then make you think a lot because last year, some of the questions that came to me, uh, you know, there were people who were saying that, why are you stuck up in Nepal? You know, why don't you take up an international position somewhere around in the US? You know, those are some of the questions that nobody would perhaps ask me. And then when it comes from a young mind, then I, you know, have, um, you know, private discussions with them. So it has given me a great opportunity in terms of, uh, you know, opening yourself to a larger world and allowing questions to be asked on your life and the direction of life you're taking. So which, again, is a sort of a way in which we all, I feel, should move. And this is something that I encourage everybody is to take, get into a reflective journey, uh, do a lot of reflection, uh, take a lot of feedback, uh, have people talking about your life and take those some of the suggestions very, very seriously. And that will help to shape your life better. And so that's where I'm seeing it. And, and it's I know it's going to be a very long drawn uh, journey. And I'm really looking forward to more cases. And, you know, it also helps me to think, reflect and take your life ahead in the direction which should be the right one. Yes. Wow. Very, very interesting. And I'm not sure if uh, we'll be able to catch hold of the case study, but I would really request you to write uh, one of the books of the many, many books that you plan to write upon yourself and your journey so that all of us, you know, we can <laughs> take inspiration endlessly from that. Um, so as we uh, come towards the end of this segment, before we move on to the next segment, Sujeev, I, uh, the, the last thing you know, that I want to ask from you is that we all know that you are the CEO, the chief eternal optimist. So from you especially, I want to know and I, I want you to tell our students that what do you think this year 2021 looks like? And uh, especially for students, what do you think the future looks like? I, the way I see it is that 2021, again, it's comparative, uh, is definitely going to be not as bad as 2020. It is not going to be 2019 for sure. Uh, but at least if you look at the pandemic, the vaccination is there. If you look at Nepal, India, there's been a lot of herd immunity. Uh, if you see the cases, the incidence is coming down. It's only about how we now connect with the global world. Uh, that is a, how you travel out, uh, you know, so that's a challenge. So for especially for students who are trying to 
uh, take go back to their university to their campuses or you know get into physical interaction that's uh, you know the, the challenge but i think it should be better also i think 2020 perhaps helped us to uh, think of where should you keep your expectations so 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 in all my uh, discussions we are having internally um, you know in our strategy meetings is that the status quo is the growth this year. If you land up with the same amount of money in the bank, with the same number of people, with everything status quo this year means that is growth. So, so it's 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 so it is about the perspective you look at. So, 2021 would be that if we can end 2021 the way we are now, we should be super happy. Anything above this is bonus. Also, I think it's important to take long term view. And we have seen that, say, for instance, in Nepal, after the earthquake, we had problems, but there was a huge construction boom after that. So if you look at wars, you know, so if you look at when wars end, there's a huge amount of economic activity that takes place. Uh, so we have to think that if 2021 is going to be recovery, 2022, 23 is going to be running a lot. There is going to be, there's been huge geo uh, you know, sort of uh, geopolitical transformation that has taken place. If you look at what is happening in China with its own economic growth, that's, that's great. I mean, we just looked at the Indian budget that has come out day before. It is ambitious to push growth. Uh, US is going to, you know, sort of reach out to the world. Uh, we've seen UK, they, you know, bungled on the, uh, you know, managing the pandemic, but they're doing vaccination pretty well. So don't, uh, don't, you know, there could be a situation where you can get in July a four week package to the UK to get yourself vaccinated, you know, uh, uh, so, so they're going to be, you know, and Europe is going to look differently. So in all this, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And so as students is to look at where is my career going to be? What are some of the things that have worked very well? Uh, during this time, what is that going to lead to? Uh, so in December, I was actually uh, a judge at the Disruption Summit of University of Munich and Babson College, where young entrepreneur students were pre uh, presenting some disruption, disruptive ideas on business. And we've seen that there's been so much of innovation that has taken place. So if you look at in France, more companies have been registered in the last quarter of 2020 than ever before, because everybody is trying to do something new, something different. So it's all about trying to figure out what can you do better? You know, how can you, you know, sort of take a long term view and, you know, sort of accelerate the pace of your learning, accelerate the pace of your adoption of the new normal. So I think I would say that 2021 would be uh, the year where you look at a new mindset, get ready for this new world that is emerging. And as things will start normalizing in 2022, 23, you should be way ahead of the others. And that's how you're going to, you know, sort of lead. And so that's the sort of uh, the mindset uh, I would see that's useful for young professionals, for students, and for a lot of even mature businesses. Understood. Understood. That's absolutely great. I mean, uh, makes sense. Hundred percent makes sense. And uh, I'm getting so many questions here on the chat. But before we uh, move on to that, you know, our next segment is uh, sort of a rapid fire. You know, because uh, uh, there are a lot of questions that we already got from the students before we started with this discussion. You know, they read about your work extensive work that you've done in all fields they read your articles they they read about you and uh, they were very inquisitive so um, i are you ready sure. <laughs> yeah. okay let's go so let's fire them up <laughs> okay here's the first one already you've already answered this but maybe in one line you can uh, let us know the first question is how did you stay motivated during the pandemic um keeping your awareness levels high great great the next one is uh actually i will club the second and the third question um the, the question says that is there any tool that one could use uh to write a book successfully first and sec and, and the next question that i i want you to answer with this one is that 
before pandemic you might be uh, you might have or might get an opportunity to sort of create an ambiance or an environment where you could collect your thoughts sit down and then you know write uh, your thoughts into paper when you were trying to write a book but after pandemic when everyone is working from home cooking at home everyone is at home so how did you manage to you know find and create uh, that sort of an environment and ambiance so i want you to answer these two questions yeah the first one i think is that when you you don't go and write a book straight you begin with small steps so my work began with columns so if you are a fiction writer then begin with short stories that's what i you know sort of uh, tell people and uh, for me it's about writing those columns columns becomes books and then books becomes more books so you have to take small steps there is no big step that you know tomorrow i write a book and you know if you look at any successful author uh, you'll see them begin as columnists you look at tom fredman he wrote multiple years for new york times becoming before becoming the you know fredman or you know look look at anyone you know the malcolm gladwell or daniel goldman they have written innumerable in pieces in the harvard business review before they you know became what they are so it's important to start with small steps and i think that's important in terms of um, the it is all about space is a mental issue you know it's a mental thing that to what does space mean to you so within the space even within one room you can create a little uh, space that is very inspiring for yourself so you can find that little balcony with just one chair and a table that can be super inspirational so it's not about you know wanting a big garden and you know a lake view to write which is ideal but you can just be in a small corner of your you know big room or even your small room and then just having the right positive frame of mind and you know sort of looking at you know you know looking internally uh, looking at yourself internally and to see that where your thoughts are coming from so if you start this positive dialogue with yourself and i think space is not an issue so you can use different techniques of course i use the uh, meditation retreat techniques to do find time and the discipline around writing but it it is you know you can do it your way there is no right way but it's all about the positivity and the mental space that's where it becomes very important rather than a physical space great great amazing so moving on to the next one uh, you are you going to love this question uh, the question is that how long did it take you to complete a project before and after pandemic i know this answer already but i want you to answer this i think uh, it's all about again setting a timeline so when i uh, decided to do my nepali uh, ebook and an audio book so i just gave myself 10 days and it was like a fully in a uh, like you do a meditation retreat you seclude yourself even you're in a lockdown you're in the same house but you seclude yourself you build up a routine and you know sort of uh, phone and social media habits to be able to find enough time and concentration to you know sort of look at as a block of time and finish it so so it, you know i mean i generally feel a 10 15 day time frame is a good time to produce some good work and it could be you know writing strategic plans or writing a book or or just writing a piece of music or writing a script i think it's a good time to really think so i think it's all about how you how you you know organize the time within your own mind again it's such a mind game agreed agreed moving on to the next one uh, how did the idea of writing unleashing the vajra occur to you so i was writing uh, you know unleashing nepal was popular i did a you know a revised edition it was a 2009 book i did a revised edition in 2013 uh, it got released and then you know sort of uh, it was a time when as i said there were two things that uh, struck me one was that people wanted me to delve into the history a bit more uh, so that forced me to do more research and to bring about uh, perspectives from nepal from the 6th 7th century the other is that when i wrote unleashing nepal i just come out of a corporate job you know as uh, leading the largest business group here so i always thought that uh, money investments and management can change everything but over a period of time of working i thought i got to realize i got to learn 
that you need to have societal transformation to bring about economic transformation. So, so the stark difference, I would say, between my first book where, you know, I talk about investments, I talk about management skills, I move into more deeper issues of societal transformation. And then, you know, and where does the societal transformation come from? And that will come from human transformation. That may be the next work I'll, you know, be engaged in. Absolutely. And we are really looking forward to that one. Absolutely. Moving on quickly to the next one. Um, wow, this is a really interesting question. What was your reaction when you earned the title of Nepal's chief eternal optimist? <laughs> no, it was good. I think you know, I try to always see the glass half full. Um, I try to keep myself positive, uh, not just for the sake of being positive, but I think it's just having that sort of the mindset. And uh, generally, uh, people, you know, sort of are always talking about the problems. But then delving on the, you know, sort of uh, optimism can be a good business. And I think that, you know, that title helped me a lot. You know, a lot of people, uh, you know, sort of swim in pessimism, but you can look at optimism because there are very few players. There's very little competition on optimism, and that's where you you sort of uh, benefit. And then you know when a title like that comes in, you know you 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 get excited. You know, absolutely. I mean, that's a great title to have. Okay, so uh, the next question. Um, this is uh, I I'll just read out the question. You'll know why this is such a lovely and interesting question. I know the answer, but you know I wanted to hear it from you. Uh, what difference do you find between the two countries, India and Nepal, and also what connects these two countries? It's a very good question. No, very good question. And I think uh, the connection, I would say, is that the difference, I would say, let's go with the positive. The, the positive is that it's a part of a larger South Asian, you know, I call myself a Himalayan citizen, I'm a South Asian citizen. So it's a part of the larger South Asian milieu, which has got its own challenges, it has got deep uh, cultural, historical, uh, religious, you know, uh, similarities, the way it works. And, you know, I mean, from the food habits to your entertainment, uh, to everything, there's a lot of commonality. Um, also because there is a large Nepali population in India and a large uh, population of people of Indian origin in Nepal. So, so it's a, you know, sort of, a, it just, uh, it just, it's very difficult to distinguish between the two countries. Having said that, the two fundamental differences I find between the two countries is that I find India very entrepreneurial and Nepal is very rent seeking. And uh, I say that because in India, people really work hard to uh, get to wherever, you know, I mean, a cab driver in Del Delhi is not going to ever imagine that would send their kids to Australia to study, you know, finance this because you don't think it is, you know, but in Nepal, people do have these type of mindset. And it also comes from the fact that 86% of Nepalis own land. Whereas in India, it's between 50 to 60 percent. So there is a lot of rent seeking uh, that you see. And that is one. The other is that the consumption. You know, the way people consume in Nepal is differently than the way it consumes in uh, India. So I remember when I was with a vice president of a large FMCG uh, company and we, just after earthquake, we were taking a visit across uh, the country and I was showing them places and then he saw spotted in a small village shop a hair conditioner, a 500 ml bottle of hair conditioner. And then he was so surprised. He said, this is what we sell in the high-end malls in India. You know, so, so if you look at the way people consume, so when, you know, the pandemic struck, none of the consumption has gone down here. People have not stopped eating meat you know, uh, three times a week, people, you know, those who are doing it, people have not stopped doing so many things. So it stems from the fact that you have a lot of ancestral property. Uh, there's a lot of money that comes through remittances. So the people who are spending money are not necessarily the people who are earning it. 
So, so those are two stark differences I see. Whereas in India, it is very entrepreneurial. People are very conscious. You know, there's a in Nepal. If you ask people, do people make budgets to for their households? I don't think so. People going to buy a you know a, a twenty lakh car lands up buying a forty lakh car. In India, even a person who goes and buys an Audi would have a budget that he's not going to buzz too much about, on. No, so it's again the mindset part of it. So these are some of the stark differences I find. But again, culturally, socially, culturally, you know, sort of religious, you know, a lot of ways we are very, very similar. Interesting, very, very interesting. As I said, it is a lovely question, and uh, interestingly, uh, India and Nepal being so close, our uh, borders connect. Uh, still, there are so many questions that uh, we do not know the answers to. So it is. I'm really happy that the students are asking the right questions. It is very important to understand the 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 smallest and the little aspects uh, that connect us and that make us different, uh, and and then connect us all over again. Um, so uh, moving on to the last question of this segment, uh, it's more of a very I would say technical or a serious question, but I would rephrase it a bit because part of it you've already answered before in the discussion. Um, the the students they want to know that since you are the chairperson at NEF at Nepal Economic Forum, you know you have been watching very closely the pandemic and its impact globally on businesses and economies. So they want to understand that what is it going to take. Um, economies to get back to normal especially uh, for frontier countries and countries like us india nepal and i would add one line to it that what is it going to take from us the citizens of these countries to help these economies get back to the normal i think the the key is that um we have to look at economy growth in a 5 to 10 year perspective you know, if it's like a stock market, you know, like people say, if you invest in an index, you'll never go wrong. So look at BAC, you know, it's close to 50,000. So if you have invested in index, it's always a long term investment. So similarly, economies, you need to look from a long term perspective. So in the long run, there is not going to be much disruption. So if you look at 2025, 2030, there's not this disruptions are in the short run and economies we have also seen tend to recover very faster than what we think. So if you look at the 2008 crisis, you look at uh, so many of the crisis economies go through, it's very rare that, you know, economies, you know, sort of uh, go down because parts of the economy does very well. And parts, you know, sort of, I mean, in Nepal, we have, all the banks have performed amazingly. We are the, 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 the bank deposit to GDP ratio is about 104%. You know, so it's, it's amazing how, you know, one point, of course, when the banks have too much of money means that there is no investment happening and there's no economic activity happening. So we need to connect these things. And so if you see in the long run, the economy is not going to get into a major issue. So in the short run, there is the recovery and the recovery generally happens fast until unless you're going to have some major pro political crisis, then you will have challenges uh, with the economy and having working in Africa, we've seen, you know, sort of countries, despite all the challenges, it grows, it doesn't grow very fast, but it does not go into recession. It does not go, you know, uh, into the negative. So it's all about, again, the mindset issue. What is going to be very important from a citizen's perspective is that this whole sense of nationalism, uh, towards, you know, you have to, uh, you know, sort of uh, nationalism towards making in your own country, your own brand, not getting imports, like what we've seen with the United States, we've seen it with other countries also, that will definitely have challenges. What we have seen with the vaccine issue in Europe and UK, we have to keep an open mind because when we are consuming things, we don't know where it is manufactured. If you look at the Apple phone we are using, we don't know where the components are coming from. So, so we have to keep the open mind that we need to get, uh, you know, sort of international investments. We need to get foreign technology and we need to have, you know, uh, investments for growth. So that's very important. Most of the time in crisis, and this is what we've seen in the past also, and that's a very big case in uh, Nepal, is that 
Whenever there's crisis, nationalism plays, comes in front. And people will say, no, 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 we should not allow foreign investment. We should not allow. We should do it ourselves. We should produce ourselves, which means it allows a certain segment of rent seekers to, you know, sort of prosper. And having studied in Calcutta, I've seen West Bengal in the 80s with the same mindset. If you look at larger India in the late 60s and 70s, uh, the sort of uh, nationalism, and that did not, you know, help much. And we see in many other countries, the nationalism of U.S. has damaged them tremendously in the past four years. Whereas China keeps itself very open. They have serious issues on paper. But if you look at the amount of U.S. investments in China in 2020, it is much higher than any of the previous years. They have invited U.S. firms to come and invest in strategic investments, strategic infrastructure, you know, and then that's where they are pushing growth. You may say, you may talk about nationalism, but in action, they are promoting foreign investment, foreign technology. So, so we, I think that is going to be a key thing we need to really understand and be ready for, because if we are going to push nationalism too far, that's going to impact the economy in a big way in the long run. So that's the only sort of the caveat I have. But over of three to four years, we would see growth uh, taking place. I don't think there should be worried about it. No wonder you have been given the title of Chief Eternal Optimist because you truly are. And uh, I, for one, would undoubtedly want to believe this side of the story. It makes me feel hopeful. And uh, you've rightly pointed out uh, some of the very uh, serious concerns that we need to take care of. Um, now, as we open the floor to questions from students that I've been getting here on our chat, uh, some of the questions I want to tell the students that uh, some of the questions that they have been sending have already been answered by Sujeev over this chat, over this discussion that we are having. Uh, but uh, still, I will uh, try my best to uh, take all the questions that are coming up. Um, uh, there's uh, this question uh, from Harshin. She is uh, asking you uh, to, to tell you before I start asking the questions to tell you, Sujeev, these are some very personal questions as I'm seeing here. Personal in the sense that students are asking questions that are very close to them that, you know, they want to understand uh, some tips uh, from you, how they can, you know, sort of uh, uh, help their uh, help themselves and their career move forward. So in line with that, I'm 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 uh, quoting this question from Harshin. Um, she's asking that uh, she wants to pursue a career in foreign language. Yeah. So yeah, uh, she wants that. to know. Yeah. So so she she. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. So uh, she wants to know that uh, she wants to pursue a career in foreign language. So she wants to know that what are the options and how does the opportunity in the uh, and the scope of a foreign language look like, according to you, since you have such a global uh, uh, aspect. Yeah, so so when people ask me, uh, what is it that I regret uh, not doing in the past two, three decades, I think definitely I say that it's learning foreign language. It's not I didn't I try I tried my you know, I'm still trying. Uh, so I would say that, you know, I mean, when I my team members ask me, I my the first two languages that come to my mind, if you're not from India, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, sort of if you're from India, is that uh, French, because it opens like working in Africa, the knowledge of French is so important because there are so many Francophone countries and it opens up a lot of writing and discourses that have been written. So French is one and the other is definitely Chinese. And I think it's uh, if you know Hindi, you know Chinese, then you can communicate with nearly one third of humanity. Uh, so that's that's a you know, it's no harm in learning languages. And I think a lot of uh, people I know have indulged and also, learning languages have become easier. Uh, my daughter uses Duolingo, an app to learn new languages. So it's become cheaper. It's become easier. So definitely, yes, it opens up newer uh, vistas for your career. And also, it opens up newer things to read. Because if I would write more on 
Nepal's history, say, you know, sort of before the 10th century, I would need to write, learn Chinese. I should be able to read Chinese because a lot of it has been written in Chinese. You know, like in, you can read, you know, if you know Sanskrit, you would get to learn history like, you know, nobody has. So it's the same. So, so it all depends on what your needs are, but always good to learn a language. Agreed. Agreed. So uh, the next question is from Manik. Uh, he is asking that he aims to be an artist, but he has faced many problems. So similarly, he wants to know from you that uh, that uh, did you face many hurdles uh, while you were trying uh, in in the the in this uh, path of of uh, trying to discover yourself as an author, and uh, how did you overcome them? I think uh, it's it's like the analogy I use is when you go trekking, when you go uh, trekking, it's never easy. You are climbing hills, you know, you are, you are, you know, it's, it's very steep. It will be hot. You are sweating. Your legs are hurting. But then when you finish the journey and you get on the top and you see that beautiful view of the mountain or you, you know, get to, you know, experience that cool breeze on top of the mountain, I think then you feel that, that all that was worth it. I, I'm yet to know of any journey that doesn't have any problems, whether you, you know, you're on a flight, you know, it can, the planes might be rattling at takeoff, you know, but then once it cruises at an altitude, it's, it's amazing. So it's the same thing in life is that you are going to face problems. That's how I see it. Uh, but it's like uh, without the problems, you will not get anywhere because you only, you know, sort of get to the solution because there are problems. If there are no problems, there's no solution because a solution comes out of the problem. So that's how I look at it. And I think, uh, you know, it's only a matter of how much of time it takes to, you know, get over the problem. But I think uh, problems are integral of the solution. Uh, so that's how I look at it. I say if you have Agreed. saying 2 Agreed. plus 2 is equal to 4, the solution 4 only comes when there's a 2 twos. you know. If there's no tools, then there's no solution. So it's, it's, a, it's a very simple way of looking at it. But I think you can take some deep, uh, reflections on it and, uh, you know, look at what are the problems and, you know, and how you can overcome it. And that's what has been my life. I look at problems and I enjoy. It's like when you reach on the top of the hill, as I mentioned earlier, and you see where you started and what are the issues, you know, problems you had as you got to the top. You know, you it's the joy at the top is amazing. Agreed, agreed. And I hope that uh, answers Manik's question and you answered it beautifully. Uh, moving on, the next question is from Palak. Uh, she, again, it's a very personal career oriented question. She's asking that a lot of students are taking extra courses, you know, apart from their curriculum. So according to you, since uh, you have so much experience uh, with working professionals and you travel across the globe you see different economies so according to you what do you think are some really important courses that students should consider you know nowadays apart from their uh, for me the way i see it is that uh, there are two reasons people take courses one is to accumulate certificate one is to accumulate knowledge so one, you need to prioritize that whether you want to accumulate certificate. That's what I've seen a lot of people during the pandemic. Every fifth day, I see a certificate being posted on LinkedIn. Now, is that what you want or do you really want to deepen your knowledge? So that's a big call to take. Some certificates are definitely, you know, useful. So if you have a, a certificate in a foreign language or in some, you know, you're uh, working in banking and you've done a risk appraisal, you know, sort of a course. That is very useful. But then I think it's more about seeking more knowledge. And, and, and today, I would say is that learning has become easier. You go to Coursera, you, there's so many MOOCs, there's so many platforms that you give you a lot of free knowledge, uh, free courses. But, but then it's important to see that how do you interact more? It is about learning from other human beings. And I think courses that allow you to do that, you know, if you are in a small cohort and you're working on a case, a communication case, I think you learn more 
than going into the best courses on communication from the best universities in the world. So it's all about what do you want to learn? And then definitely, I think the easier learning is on technical skills, but the difficult two things to learn is the social skills, uh, the, the soft skills. So it's important to indulge in learning the soft skills and to say that how do you and whether it's be written communication it could be you know oral communication it could be so many presentation skills it could be different skills so 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 i think that is where i would say that a lot of people who indulge in that during the pandemic they have benefited and they and i even with my team members and people i've interacted with i've seen some stock uh, you know sort of uh, changes and uh, stock um, I would say uh, positive transformation in those individuals. Interesting. Agreed. 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 And I hope that answers Palak's question. Um, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned before, but we also have some young professionals with us today uh, who were listening to this uh, this conversation. So the last question is is from uh, one of them. It's from Meghna and uh, uh, going back to uh, our discussion over the economy and, and the government plan, I, I, she asked here that, uh, do you think that pandemic has given a chance to refresh and revive a development plans for sustainable recovery? Um, yes, I would definitely think uh, it also is linked to the larger geopolitics. Uh, definitely, people have become more aware of, uh, you know, climate change, about sustainable development and having been working on circular economy. We are reviving that we are, you know, getting into more deeper discourses on that because one thing is finite is natural resources. You know, and we have to understand that and continuous exploitation that we have done over these, you know, millennials, we have, we have, you know, millions of years, we've, you know, sort of, uh, we cannot do that. And that's there. But also it is about the intent and generally intent in these areas are always led by large nations. Uh, we see how China has transformed in the past 20 years in terms of handling air pollution to greening to, you know, like, for instance, now in China, you can't make bricks uh, out of fresh soil. You have to recycle if you want to make bricks, you know. So these things are now with the United States, again, with the new, under the new administration, uh, taking it as a priority, uh, that's going to, you know, be positive. I think uh, we've seen Scandinavian countries, um, you know, sort of leading the discourse. And in the emerging economies, be it in, you know, sort of, uh, be it in South Asia, Southeast Asia, or in Africa, we see the discourse being more important. Uh, you cannot just, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of sweep it under the carpet. Uh, it is becoming an important discourse. And over a period of time, and people got a lot of time during this pandemic to reflect on this. And definitely some of the recoveries that are going to happen are going to happen, you know, sort of, uh, uh, in a sustainable manner where, you know, looking at the future, looking at impact of climate change, um, looking at the circularness of the economy, those are going to become important. Agreed. Thank you so much, Sujeev. That was very, very insightful. And I hope that answers Meghna's question. And um, I mean, we are at the end of uh, our discussion today. I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for taking out time. Uh, I personally feel that it was a really, really good discussion. But, you know, the, to be honest, uh, Sujeev, your knowledge, your experience uh, and your exposure is so vast. It's so vast. And you have you are a walking uh, talking knowledge bank and there's so much to learn from you so it would be really unfair to say that this was it and we can limit it to a hour or, or hour and a half or hour and 15 discussion we cannot and we hope that we get more and more chances to do something like this again and we have more and more students with us who will ask some really uh, important questions that need to be asked Thank you so much, Sujeev. No, thank you. Thank you, Akanksha. This has been a nice, you know, sort of uh, 
reflective time because I also enjoy these conversations because it pushes me to reflect and, and I, I enjoy that. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was so enlightening and inspiring at the same time to hear from you. Uh, we learned so many things um, in just a short span of 60 minutes. But my personal favorite was that problems are the integrals of solutions. We have four because of two and two. And uh, looking at the positive side of the dark cloud 2020 is that we need to give as much importance to basic things as we give to bigger things. So uh, thank you so much, sir. And we look forward to such enlightening, uh, enlightening sessions with you in the future. Thank mm -hmm. you, ma'am, for giving me and everybody in the audience this opportunity to hear, to hear to sir and learn these amazing things. Thank you for inspiring us. And I hope uh, everybody of us take that optimism, take that positivity of yours and we learn to be positive. Look at the positive side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anushka. Thank, Thank you, you Sujeev.